Hi, this is Sam Weidel with V1 Rotate, and this week we're going to talk about glass cockpit airplanes and whether you should learn to fly in one. Ever since pretty much the dawn of aviation, pilots have argued endlessly about their favorite airplanes, the fastest, the best handling, the best looking, and so on. Along the same lines, high wing versus low wing, tail dragger versus tricycle gear, Lycoming versus Continental. Among those airplanes used for primary flight training, there's an equally long-standing debate among students and flight instructors about which airplane is best for learning to fly. Nowadays, the introduction of technologically advanced glass cockpit trainers has added a new twist to the argument. When I started learning to fly in 1994, I didn't have much choice. The only flight school within a reasonable distance had a couple of old Cessna 150s and a 172, which were good airworthy airplanes, but they were pretty basic. The 150, if I recall, had a single navcom, while the 172 was technically IFR and had dual navcoms and an ADF, but neither had GPS. That was pretty rare and expensive in those days. In fact, I never flew with GPS until I was taking instrument training in college, and then I saved a bunch of money by being one of few students willing to fly a 10-year-old Piper Cadet with no GPS. Today, of course, it's quite different. GPS has become absolutely standard, as has ADS-B and the use of tablet-based DFBs. Beyond that, there are quite a few training aircraft that have full glass cockpits more advanced than the airliners I fly for work. Depending on the size of your home airport, you may have a choice. So, what's better for learning to fly? A cheap basic Betty that's been around the block a time or two? Or the latest and greatest with all the bells and whistles and a price to match? Because I'm flying a 1946 Stinson 108, you might guess that I'm about to argue in favor of more basic trainers, and you'd be right, in many but not all cases. But let me be clear about one thing. I am not against technology in general aviation or in flight training for prospective professional pilots. GPS, inexpensive miniaturized AHARs replacing vacuum instruments, ADS-B, in-flight weather and traffic and terrain avoidance technology are all wonderful advances that have helped to improve safety. And learning to work with in-flight technology and developing good habits to integrate tech into your flying are very important parts of training to be a professional pilot. However, I do think that introducing too much technology too quickly is counterproductive and that simplicity is better for when you're first learning to fly. Once you have the basics down, there's plenty of time to introduce more complexity. I feel that the best time to start training in a glass cockpit technologically advanced aircraft or TAA is during your instrument course or during cross-country time building between private and instrument. When this airplane was built in 1946, this was an advanced VFR cockpit. This airplane was meant for traveling, not training. Most students back then learned on even simpler airplanes like the J3 Cub or Aronka Champ. Many of these airplanes didn't even have radios or electrical systems and their panels contained the minimum legal VFR instrumentation. Back then, it was common to solo in only six or seven hours and to get your private ticket in the prescribed 40 hours. Nowadays, many students don't solo until 25 or 30 hours and it's not unusual for the PPL to take 70 or 80 hours or more. Now, it's not that students have gotten dumber since the 1940s, or that instructors have gotten more cautious, or that schools have gotten more greedy. Airports are busier, airspace is more complex, and the FAA has added requirements for basic night and instrument training. But those elements were already in place when I learned to fly in the 1990s, and average first solo and private pod check ride hours have increased since then. What changed is that the training aircraft have become orders of magnitude more complicated. That, along with the increased rental rate of most advanced aircraft, has greatly increased the cost of learning to fly. Now, frankly, if you've decided to become a professional pilot, you've already resigned yourself to throwing a hundred grand down the rat hole, and an extra five grand to get your private is no big deal. And anyways, you're eager to get on with it to experience your new life as a pro pilot. The school's advertising shows this gorgeous high-tech cockpit that looks a lot like those jets you want to fly. Why not jump into it right away? You have no aspirations of flying dumpy 1960s round gauge airplanes for a living, right? Here's the thing, you gotta crawl before you walk and walk before you run. Pro pilot flight training is a steady progression with each step building on the last. 
First you learn to fly, then you learn to do it by instruments, then in complex airplanes, and then in faster multi-engine aircraft. It's crucial to master each step in turn, and I think that primary training is the most difficult and crucial of all. Think about it. We're taking people who are used to operating simple, stable motor vehicles in a fairly controlled two-dimensional environment and developing their ability to think and maneuver and navigate an aircraft in a rather dynamic three-dimensional environment, primarily by reference to external cues and landmarks. It's pretty amazing, actually. The stick and rudder skills you learn during primary training are so critical to get right, both for your safety as you gain experience and for your professional development. To be honest, I really think our recent focus on technology has done our new pilots a disservice by de-emphasizing the basic skills that form the foundation of an aviation career. I've said it before, flying jets will not improve your stick and rudder skills, it will degrade them. We at the airlines are dealing with a spate of loss of control accidents and are belatedly realizing the importance of great stick and rudder skills alongside things like CRM and systems knowledge and automation management. Any regional airline captain will tell you that B1 cuts are no big deal and an ILS approach to minimums is a breeze. What really makes them uncomfortable is a new first officer cleared for a visual approach from downwind with no other guidance. It's frankly not that much better at the majors. If I were the king of aviation, and consider this my campaign launch, I would start everyone out in gliders for 10 hours, then solo them in a cub, then move to a round gauge 172 for cross countries, and finally transition them to a glass cockpit after their private pilot check ride. Before their commercial check ride, I'd also give them 10 hours in a super decathlon to explore flying at the edges of the envelope, and 10 hours in a super cub for mountain flying and real world soft and short field work. A loss I don't expect to be elected or appointed king of aviation in the near future. And I recognize that not everyone has access to gliders or Piper Cubs. But I do think that even in your basic bone stock 172, developing good stick and rudder skills during primary training requires that your focus be outside the cockpit a good 75% of the time. That's difficult to do when you have acres of pretty screens with scans of information sitting right there in front of you. Now, again, I'm not completely anti-technology here. Gliders and cubs notwithstanding, I now consider ADS-B to be an absolutely indispensable safety tool for any general aviation airplane, including my Stinson. Traffic information is particularly important in training aircraft as they spend a lot of time in busy practice areas and traffic patterns. In-flight weather updates absolutely make cross-country flights safer and less stressful. Electronic flight bags are great for putting relevant information right at your fingertips without getting buried in paper charts and manuals. As you can see, all this is available even in a fairly original 76-year-old airplane with a very basic panel that's great for keeping your focus outside. Now, all this said, the right training airplane is the one with the best rental availability that comes with a knowledgeable, dedicated flight instructor who you work well with. People have learned to fly and everything up to SR-22s and beach bonanzas. And if your flight school of choice has nothing but glass cockpit trainers, that's okay. Just understand that you need to put extra ground time into really learning the interface, including the use of computer simulator software, until it's basically second nature. Don't get sucked into the habit of constantly fussing with the automation, and remember to keep your focus outside the airplane where it belongs during primary flight training. Thanks for watching V1 Rotate. For more great content for new and aspiring professional pilots, join me here at flyingbag.com every first and third Friday of the month.